This lecture will be focusing on the Constitutional Convention. Just a reminder, Shays' Rebellion was in 1786. Farmers were deeply in debt, and then Eastern merchants pushed through a state tax that would hurt farmers more. Farmers petitioned for relief, but no one listened. They then demanded that the courts be closed so they wouldn't lose their farms. The breaking point was when Daniel Shays led an army of 1,200 farmers to close the courts. The state militia was called in, four farmers dies, died, and the rest scattered. Here's an image from Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion isn't necessarily important as much for the actual rebellion, but rather for the conversation that came from it. In September 1786, national leaders such as James Madison and Alexander Hamilton called a meeting of delegates from all the states. This was the Annapolis Convention. Only five showed up. When only five states are represented, if you guys remember from the Articles of Confederation, nothing can be done. The only way the Articles of Confederation can be amended is if all 13 were in agreement. If only five states show up, you don't even have a consensus to be able to change any laws or make any laws, nevertheless amend the Constitution. So all present decided to call for another meeting of all the states next year in Philadelphia to deal with trade and other national problems. And that's going to lead to the Constitutional Convention. Now, the Constitutional Convention is very important. One of the things that you need to realize is it got the nickname the Miracle in Philadelphia. You have 55 delegates coming from 12 states. You have um, the average age was uh, 20s. The oldest guy there was Ben Franklin um, at the age of 82. But most of the guys were in their 20s or early 30s. George Washington was the president of the convention. And all of them were there to try to figure out what to do about the Articles of Confederation and what to do about this government that they created. And the very first thing they decided was that they couldn't continue with the Articles as they were. This alliance of states was not functioning because people were worried about what happened to their state and not the national government as a whole. So they decided in August in Philadelphia to throw out the Articles and to start over, draft an entirely new government, a government with a foundation in federalism, a balance between states and federal government, and, and trying to figure out what best way to make sure that the states have their power, but that there was a government to control everyone and to watch out for everyone's interests. And they came up with the Constitution, a document that was strong enough to work in 1787 and still work today, and yet flexible enough to work back then and still work today. You have to realize the Founding Fathers wouldn't have foreseen creating any sort of government program to deal with things like air traffic, but they created a constitution, a document that was flexible enough to be built to allow the government to create those type of things. So let's look at some of the decisions that came from the convention. Everyone was to propose different compromises or different proposals on how the government was going to work. So one of the things was representation. How were the people going to be represented in this new government? The Virginia plan was considered the big state plan. It su suggested a bicameral legislature where membership would be based on the state's population. Voters would elect members of the lower house, and then the lower house would elect members of the upper house. Both houses would elect president and judges. This is very similar to the parliamentary system. Um, and, and sort of that's the foundation that they built it upon. The small states, on the other hand, proposed the New Jersey plan, which was a unicameral legislature, so only one house, and each state had equal vote. Very similar to the Articles of Confederation, where every state had one vote. So they came up with the Great Compromise, or the Connecticut Compromise. This would be a two-house Congress. Each state would receive equal representation in the Senate, and the size of the population would determine representation in the House of Representatives. Now, very early on in the Constitution, um, the people would vote for the members of the House, and then the state legislature would vote for the members of the Senate. We're not going to get voters being able to vote directly for their senators until the 19-teens with the 17th Amendment. So for now, the people only had direct representation in the House of Representatives. Another compromise they came up with was the Three-Fifths Compromise. Southern states, or slave states, wanted slaves to be counted in the population. Northern states didn't want them to be counted as part of the population for representation, but they did want them counted as part of the uh, state's tax revenue. 
southern states didn't want them counted as tax revenue. So the compromise would that be that three-fifths of the slave states would be counted into population, okay? So for every five white guys, they would count three slaves. They divided power between the national government and the state government. Powers given to um, the national government were delegated or enumerated. Literally, they're numbered in the Constitution. Article 1, Section 1. Article 1, Section 2. Um, and it dealt with things like foreign affairs and national defense. The state government had reserve powers. So those who were not specifically granted to the national government were given to the state. Things like supervising education and establishing marriage laws and procedures. Then we had checks and balances with the separation of powers. The legislative branch makes the laws. The executive branch would carry out the laws and the judicial branch would hear the cases. With checks and balances, they could make sure that no one branch was bigger than the other. So when the legislative branch made a law, if that law was unconstitutional, the judicial branch could knock it down. The executive branch would decide whether or not to sign that law into office. If he decides not to sign the law, the legislative branch can always override that, that veto. They all can check each other and control each other's power. We also have the Electoral College. The Electoral College was a way to try to check the power of the people in electing the president. Every state has a, a number of electors. For example, Virginia has 11. It's a based on the number of representatives we have, plus our senators, so nine representatives, 11, or excuse me, two senators, 11 electors. And those 11 electors will vote for a uh, president for us based on the popular vote from the state. This is the end of the um, Constitutional Compromise, uh, Constitutional Convention and Compromise lecture. The next lecture will be on how this Constitution will be ratified and a few more compromises that need to come from it.